Yeah, I'm uh sitting with my daughter in Togo. My oldest daughter. We was over here talking about the economy. <laughs> and um I'm not even an advocate for like the American economy or nothing like that at all. You know. We're in Africa. So that 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 tell you all you need to know. But we're trying to establish ourselves outside of the construct and outside of the capitalistic construct. That's what we're doing. So like we realized when we got here to Africa is that we're in we, we were in the city for like two, three months and then we moved to the village and now we're establishing ourselves just like outside the village. Just outside of a village. So it's very rural, you know, it's very off grid. It's very off grid. But when we first got here, we realized like the construct, the cities, the city state, it's the same all over the world at various levels of attractiveness. Like we were like, okay, so America, what's the American economy like? Okay, it's like this. We go here, it'll be a different economy. And what we found out, it's all the same. It's all the same, y'all. Like, actually, the prices are actually the same. People talk about getting a good exchange rate and stuff. That's a big lie. I'm an economist, by the way. Like, I study economics at University of Michigan. Like, I'm, a, I'm an economist. I study mathematics as well. So, like, I know, I know what they taught. I never forgot none of those lessons. And, like... I'm looking at the market economy here. I'm looking, I'm comparing it to the one in America. And what prompted me to do this video with my daughter, we're here in, a, in the big city. We came into the city to just get some things and stuff. And I, I, every time I come into the city, I observe the changes. And for me, cause I'm an economist, I always apply them to the economy like, you know, I'm a liberated man, but I'm a trained economist from when I was in the construct. You know, like Moses was a uh, was an aristocrat. Like he was like one of the sons of Pharaoh. He was a liberated man as a shepherd out in Midian and out in the wilderness, but he still had that training. And so like, I still have that training. And so like, for me, when I come into the construct, when I come into the city, I'm automatically like, okay, what's the economy doing, you know? I was, um, I was inside of an electronics place trying to get it a, a different type of phone and I was I was t we were we were, we were kind of haggling over the price of it and I showed him the phone online or whatever and show him the price and stuff and he was like yeah okay and I was when we got here the exchange rate was one thing so I was like yeah so basically if you translate the price of what I'm showing you online and let's not account for like how much it costs y'all to ship it or whatever but if you do account for all of that Still, this phone shouldn't be no more than a hundred of these units. I'm in Togo, and a unit is the franc safer. So I was like, it shouldn't be no more than a hundred units, which is a hundred dollars, you know, for this. Even less, it should be about 75 units, which is Swazan cans. So I was like, it shouldn't be no more than 75 units, you know, but at the most, it's a hundred units. And he was like, that's true. But even the price that you're showing me, um, I'm, I'm about to apply the exchange rate. So he whipped out his calculator. He applied the exchange rate, and it got up to about 140 units. It went to 140 units. And 140 units is probably about 270 American dollars. And so I was like, no, nah, no, nah, there's no way, there's no way. I know what the exchange rate is. So I went to Google and I typed in the exchange rate. I was like, convert 262 American dollars to the CFA. And they converted it and the guy was right. The guy was right. And basically, based upon their units here to our units, which is dollars to Frank Safer, they're basically getting 60 cents to a dollar. 60 cents to a dollar. 60%, what they're saying is their economy is about 60% of our economy. When I, well, when I say our, the American economy. The Togolese economy, when you measure it, its strength is about 60% of the American economy. And I'm not a defender of America 
Arrow. Arrow. You see, I'm very critical of all of these, all, all of these constructs, by the way. I used to be like, no, I'm not a defender of America, but maybe Africa is different. Maybe other places are different. But now I'm realizing no matter where you go, the capitalistic construct and the money construct has made its way and put its finger on everything. It put its trademark, its tattoo on everything. It is what it is. And so I was like, well, I'm looking at the economy relatively and I've read Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations. Like I, I read the Wealth of Nations like, I study economics at University of Michigan, so I know I majored in macroeconomics with mathematics and political science. So I understand the political economy. And I looked and I'm like, when you, when you measure the metrics of what they say matters to the wealth of, the, of an economy and the strength of an economy. When you do the exports and exports, when you do the animal spirit, when you do the government spending, when you do the ability to move labor, whether labor can move about freely, whether you can get a job if you want one, whether a day's wages can buy you one unit of food, which is like, you know, a loaf of bread for your family, you know, which is like a loaf of bread, maybe some water and some beans, can like a day of work provide that basic unit with shelter? You know, and, you know, how much does it cost to transport labor? How much it cost, does it cost to move a good? What's the transportation transportation system like? What are the logistics like? Can you ship goods quickly? As far as like trains, as far as shipping and stuff like that. The places where you're trying to send things, can you easily locate them? Do they have an address? Things like that. So I'm looking at all the metrics that it takes to build a strong economy and that the unit, the unit, I'm talking about the currency that you're trading for the good. The currency ain't nothing. It's just a paper that guarantees that the good that got traded is going to arrive there. Or if it don't, you can take that currency and change it in for another good somewhere. It's just a paper contract. Fiat. And so I'm saying, is the, is the paper and are the goods there and can they be exchanged? And can they be moved around easily? And can the people count on that? The strength of a contract of the fiat money, the, the dollar. And I compare that to here. And I'm looking around, I'm like, well, the exchange rate went up to 60 cents on a dollar. And I'm saying, well, is their economy, is the economy here 60% of the American dollar? And I say, it's not even close. It's not even close. It's not close. I was asking my daughter, I said, Let's look at some of the very basic ones. That's why she's here. She was with me. She came with me to the big city this time. I always try to take one of my children with me to just show them and talk to them about things and um, give them some wisdom and learn them and just to bond with them and love them. Ellie, I was asking you, I said, when you from in, from in America, we're talking about transportation now. Transportation. So we're talking about like the streets, the cars, the vehicles how you get around from point A to point B. We're in Detroit, the Motor City. That's where we're from, so maybe it's got a little bit of a slant. But like the cities that you visited, you know, outside of Detroit and the places that you went to in America, when we've been around to different places, Alabama, DC, Baltimore, these places where we went, you know, Chicago. You remember what the American roads look like? You look like, you know what the transportation system is like. We went to Boston, you rode on their light rail, you know what I mean, you, you, you rode on their subway or whatever. They light rail. I'm asking you, what percentage, like, if, if, if we take the American transportation system, streets, cars, trains, whatever you used to get around or whatever you use to move something from one place to another, how would you compare the transportation system in America, where we were, to transportation here would you say it was at least half of it what you would say it's three quarters of it like 75 percent close to close to being the same you know close to being the same but a couple notches below or half of it or half of half you know further away from being half three quarters the other way or would you say even less than that if you could give it a percentage, she understands percentages and fractions. What percentage would you say the transportation system here 
was compared to the American transportation system. As a whole? As a whole, looking at everything, getting around the main streets, the main expressways compared to the side streets where you go in to try to get to your house or a small business. You know, um, the main streets, how big they are, how safe they are. You know, um, the main expressway, the main expressway to go throughout the country, how safe it is, how smooth it is, and, and whether you can move stuff back and forth a lot, like a lot of stuff, can you move a lot of stuff at one point? How would you compare it? Like, like 10%, because... 10%. She says 10%. Go ahead. Because, first of all, the main streets have potholes in them, and the side streets don't even have cement. It's just dirt. So mm -hmm. when it rains, it gets all puddly and sliding and stuff. So you, so that that is the, the part about transporting a lot of stuff. You can't really take a lot of things here because you'll be constantly running into potholes and then slipping in the mud. Right. Case yeah. in point, we got a car to move um, some tile for us. We were getting tile or um, slate to use to build, and we we filled it up. And he said, "Well, I'm gonna park right here on the main street." Because I can't go all the way up into, this was yesterday, I can't go all the way up into where y'all want to go to because I'm going to run the risk of getting stuck in there. But go ahead. And then about, uh, what was the other question? It was Just how streets. would you compare it? The, tra the streets, the cars, the transportation, can you move a lot of stuff? Is it easy to move the stuff? We're just talking about transportation of goods and people. Where the people can get around good whether cars can get around good, whether trucks can move things that you bought there, here and there, stuff like that. Okay, well, yeah, the thing I pretty much answered is just like, the streets have potholes in and the side streets all have dirt. And the, the majority of everything is the side streets. Mm -hmm. It's only like one or two main roads. Ah, you see what she pointed out that I didn't point out? She said the side streets are dirt roads, but she said that may not be a big deal. However, the side streets, there's only one or two main roads. So pretty much everything is dirt except for those main ones. And then those main ones have congestion, etc. You know, so the ability to move goods to and fro is just not there. The ability and, to move labor. And like that one time, remember when we were, we were uh, going to, the, to that shop, the French shop for, yeah. for the crate? Remember? Yeah. Because they only have two lanes. So remember when you were trying to get past that guy, you yeah. cut your foot open. Cut my foot open. That's right. What happened was the last time we were here, we were going to a place to get pancake, like uh, like a French version of pancake. It was a flat of pancake called a crepe. And my wife liked them. So we were going to a place. We found a little place, you know, to get a little something to kind of treat ourselves. We were going there. The, the road was slim. It was paved, but it was slim. And cars were coming on the other side. A guy tried to pass me, and I got over to the side. But the pot, but the um, sewer, they have a little bit of a sewer system going, and it, it had a grate, but the grate wasn't there, and none of the grates were there. So you could literally go into a full out. You can literally fall. Your motorcycle could literally fall into a sewer. At least the whole front tire will go in, which means you're gonna flip off the front. Like it's, it's about as wide as the fr whole front tire, and it's a total hole. It's not like a pothole, it's a total hole going down into a sewer. And I, I, I knew I couldn't go over to that or I would fall in, so I had to just try to like get over a little bit, but stay like steady. And he went by and his motorcycle pedal literally gashed my whole top foot open. I needed about 15, 20 stitches in the top of my foot. It was totally gashed wide open. And I had to be on antibiotics and stuff. That's it right there. Hold up. Oh, I can't switch this around. I don't know if you can see it. That's the scar right there. I don't know if y'all wanted to see my... I don't know if y'all wanted to see my foot on the camera. I'm sorry about that for if it was inappropriate for anybody. I, I forgot. I don't forgot about that. Because I'm just like resilient and I'm always looking for the best. So it's not like I'm really trying to complain. So like my whole foot got gashed open. And of course, I went to the hospital system. And it was the military hospital. And it was literally... Everybody were there was in plain clothes. There was nobody there like really in uniform. And it was like not very, it wasn't very clean and sanitary. And the guy even gave me a warning like, look, stay on your antibiotics. And I don't even like antibiotics. I don't like to take them. But I took them that time because my foot was wide open. You could, it was all the way 
I mean, you can see the bone. He literally opened it up, and I saw my my my, uh, my bones, the bones of my toes and my feet. So he stitched it up or whatever. Um, but that's an example of what I'm saying of how, you know, just when I compare it to American economy, and, and and there's other things to compare in terms of whether I'm enjoying myself, whether or not I would prefer to be in America. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that when I strictly look at the economy, you all better pay attention because maybe there is a famine coming or something because the world global economy that's based upon the monetary functions of the world, the world currency, the International Monetary Fund and all the world banks is jacked up because, and that's probably America's fault to some degree because they got away from the gold standard and, and tie in the money to something real tangible. They just tie in it to somebody's thoughts about how well something is doing and it's, real, it's, it's, very, it's very subjective. You have economists and you have um, physical people who like say, well, we're in charge of setting it and we, we have all these metrics that we measure, you know, and they pretty much are doing it in a lab. The person at the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve Chairman, they're doing this stuff and they're based upon, they're based upon someone else's numbers. We learn from that in America because we had that big bubble burst where like real estate people just started speculating and the, and the people with gas, they start speculating and the, and the industry doesn't really have, they have the SEC, they have things like that to try to stop people from speculating and making up numbers, but it's really not efficient. It's really not good. It's, and it's because basically the system is based upon someone's subjective beliefs about how strong something is. And maybe they haven't visited these countries recently, but whoever's valuating the currency here to the American currency and saying it's about 60%, they're way off. They way off. Like there's no way possible that the logistical, in America, people are getting packages the same day as they're ordering them online. Like you can order something at 7 a.m. online, it'll be there by, you know, 2, 2 p.m. without ever even interacting with another human being. People have addresses, people's location is getting down to like a foot, to within one foot of each other. Like the logistics are crazy in America. The shipping, the transportation of goods and labor is crazy in America, you know? Um, and in here, they have imports and exports, but I found something out and it's real. I found something out and it's very real. Everything that's been imported and exported, it says American goods on it. They all are American companies on there and people are buying it at like these very, very absorb exorbitant prices. Uh, many of the things that you buy here have American names on there and they cost twice as much here as they what they would cost in America. But they're saying that the currency here is the same strength, almost 60%, which is a ridiculous notion. But when you get the goods for me, who actually is an American, you realize that none of these goods were manufactured in America. They're all manufactured maybe China or somewhere else, and they're not real. I got a pack of Oreos yesterday, and I opened up the pack of Oreos. I said, well, I'm going to break down and get some Oreos to treat my daughter, and we'll have a little taste of, you know, the old school Oreos in America and be able to be nostalgic. The package, everything was the exact same as Oreos. There was no readily identifiable way to say that wasn't an Oreo. I opened it up and something struck me. Smell it. And Oreos have a distinctive smell. It's almost like a kind of like a chocolate charcoal. And you smell an Oreo and that smell is unforgettable. No matter whether you go to Kroger or whatever store you go to in America and they have the off-brand Oreo, the sandwich creams, the chocolate ones, and they say it's just like Oreo. When you open it up, you know it's not an Oreo, and they taste close to Oreo, but they're not an Oreo, and you can smell it, and the smell ain't there. I went to smell it, like this is probably authentic Oreo, and I was like, maybe it's just real, real old. Like, maybe like it's close to the expiration date, but they got a real Oreo because the package is it. I smelled it, and I said, I told my daughter, I was like, this ain't no Oreo. I knew it right away. The thing is, they've pirated everything that America has. And you'll see footage of um, me and my wife went and tried to buy American alcohol. But we looked at the alcohol and it was twice the amount in America. 
there was a bottle of alcohol that was 60, it would have been 60 American dollars for a fifth, which in America would have been $18. And so the excuse is, well, we imported that from America. No, you didn't. Because I'm looking at it and it literally had condensation in it. It literally had condensation in it. So they, 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 they photoshopping and they're using the labels and they're using the imprints, they're using the bottling and the caps because it's looking authentic. I'm talking about it's not looking fake, y'all. And you know a fake pair of Jordans when you see one. And you know a fake polo shirt when you see one. This stuff is like the stuff that you're buying, the stuff, the food goods. Now, they still got the fake clothes and you can tell they fake. But as far as like when you go into a grocery store and you buy the food products, like the drinks and the, and, the, and the ice cream, they got the branding all the way down. They selling Hagen dyes they selling all these goods that are being at least produced or in America, even if the company may be based somewhere else. And they're not getting it authentic. And you taste it and you're like, this is not the real thing. The Sprite, they got Sprite here. It's totally not real. You drink it and it's like, what is this? This is not Sprite. Of course, the Africans don't know it. And you look at the price when you actually get into currency exchanges. You do the currency exchange. You see, well, what am I paying for this if I was paying in American dollars? And you're paying twice as much. So for those Oreos... For the packet, and we had the small packet, the, the little economy, the one that's one, that's just one row of Oreos in America that will cost you about one dollar, maybe one dollar and fifty cent. And here it was 2.62 of their units, which is about five, almost six American dollars for just the one row. With the two, it had, it had the two rows in it, but it was like one row separate. You know? And I was like, no way. No way. And I said, so how is the is the currency here sixty percent of the American currency when by all the tangible things, insurance, you know, safety of goods, whether you buy the good and it's authentic, whether you buy the good and it's gonna stand up to time. When all those things are false, how are you saying that the that the currency here is at least sixty percent? It's a total lie. It's a total bunk lie. And an economist or a fiscal person should know this. But it's kind of like America's fault because on a global scale, America, they base their currency upon people's sentiment. They say if the American stock guys who are investing say that they have strong feelings about the American economy and they invest in American companies, then our dollar is strong. If they get scared and they feel like they don't want to invest in American, then our money is weak. And that's tied across the globe to the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and all other types of global systems of currency. And we're all based upon somebody's feelings. Me as a man, I know what happens when arguments and conclusions are made based upon somebody's feelings. Me and my wife are getting into it all the time, like she always saying, well, I feel, and I say, that's fine. I can register your feelings and I can sympathize and I can try to be um, as loving as I can and receive your feelings. But you also have to articulate to me facts too. I'm like, okay, I can receive your feelings because that's also valid. Like if you're just saying in general, no matter what the facts are, whatever I'm saying or doing is making you feel sad, that's gonna register with me. I can try to change my behavior so you don't feel so sad because I care about your emotions. On the other hand, you still have a duty to articulate to me something that is factual and tangible to substantiate your emotions. They can't just be out of nowhere. You still got to say some fact, some something that's logical to be able to at least substantiate some level of sorrow if you're saying you're sad. And if you say, no, I can't do that, I'm just sad just because, because you're a human and I love you and you're my wife, I can still try to register that. But at the same time, I have to register the fact that you don't, you have not substantiated that. And so it's totally subjective. So to some degree, it kind of gets discounted. Here, what I'm trying to tell you is, my wife, that's between me and her as far as our emotions and our marriage and the love we have for one another. But when you're talking about global economies and it's based upon sentiment, y'all got a big problem. Y'all got a big problem.
because I guess the Africans in the Togolese, they feel like their money is strong. They just feel like it. And because they just feel like it, and because they just feel like spending more money, they spend more money. But because of that, y'all saying that their money is strong? How? When I'm looking around, I'm looking around and in economics, they always base things on the rational being, the rational person, the rational economic actor. And I think we've gotten to a point in history where we've got to admit to ourselves at a certain point globally and in America, people are not behaving rationally and they're not making their decisions as rational beings anymore. I don't even think it's close. <coughs> Capitalism is trying to claim, economics is trying to claim that it's based upon the rational consumer. And what I'm saying is, the way people are consuming and the way people are living and interacting with their economy is far from rational at this point. And so it's throwing your economies off, your scale is off, your currencies are off, they're not accurate. And so, I guess people are feeling confident in Africa right now, but I'm going to be honest with you. If you're in the city, if you're not living off the grid by yourself in a village where it's beautiful, the air is beautiful, you have your own crops growing, and they're strong, you got your own house built, and everybody's safe, your family's safe, you're clean, it's hygienic, your animals, your animals are healthy, you're doing all that, then you can say, yeah, I feel good. But if you're in the inner city, the construct, the big cities, where you're relying upon the government to be able to do things and act, the behavior of this consumer here, probably even the behavior of the American consumer, juxtaposed to what its government is doing, juxtaposed to the actual wealth of its nation, by the metrics, the transportation, the labor, all of that, People are extremely irrational right now. If I wasn't off the grid, I'd be a little nervous about famines. Great, 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 huge depressions and, repre and, and repression. I'd be worried about serious famines because no. You can't really even buy a new shirt here. You, it's all clothes that are being shipped from America that people are giving away for free because it, in America they're done wearing it. When they ship it here, they think they're giving it away for free as a part of the humanitarian effort, and the people here are actually selling it for two units. In America, they gave it away for free. It's basically trash. And here they're selling it for two units. Any closing thoughts, Ellie?